Hello and welcome to Many Beat. Um, this might end up becoming a bit of a longer thing. Um, I have recently been thinking about making a sort of coherent list of problems I have identified with Bernardo Castro and his um, ontology uh, slash metaphysics called analytic idealism and um, that's what I've actually done but at the same time I found this uh, guy called Absolute Philosophy on, on the YouTubes and um, he critiques Bernardo Castro's analytic idealism in a recent video which I found to be quite interesting and I think he has uh, identified further problems that you know, sort of I hadn't necessarily ca captured or, or catched so I want to make, to make this kind of my own brainstorming video series, possibly. Uh, I hesitate to claim that I can put this within the hour, right? So I try to keep my videos below one hour for various reasons, not to get them too long and so on. But also, um, it's, it's uh, sort of, at this point, I feel I have to sort of recapture what what is the status with this analytic idealism crusade, right? And uh, it's nice to see that there are other people out there who actually criticizes Bernardo Castro, because it seems that the 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 criticisms are not really there because either either you're sort of in the materialist physicalist camp or you're in the idealist camp. It's like it's this trans warfare where the criticism both have to criticize materialism or physicalism and idealism, in a sense, right? So it's a third category of criticism that would appeal to a third category of ontology slash metaphysics slash whatever, right? And who might those be, right? Well, I find myself in that sort of a no man's land between these two, uh, you know, uh, Western Front uh, trench warfares, right? Because I find them both to be flawed for a particular, and it's the same flaw in both camps, right? Now, I'm not sure that this guy um, uh, in absolute philosophy has identified this particular aspect. I'm not sure about that. But, you know, I'll, I'll leave it open so far, right? Maybe I'll get to it later in the video. I have watched this video a couple of times, and I seem to find some very valid criticism though it's very sort of, let's say, academic, intellectual, analytic, and so on, it's not necessarily the kind of approach I would take. Um, what he does is read on, up on his shit, on Bernardo Castro's shit, find some flaw in it, and then present the flaw in a cherry-picky fashion about he said this, he said that, with a very great risk of a of a um, backlash from Bernardo Castro and his ilk that he's either taking things out of context or he's, uh, he's sort of a, a straw manning, red herringing, whatever, right? Some kind of fallacy. That's why I like to take a deconstructive approach where I go to the actual video or the actual text and says, this particular bit of the text or this particular bit of the video is where it goes wrong, right? And this guy also does that to some extent uh, to, you know, make his uh, criticism sort of um, has some meat to it, right? And uh, but it's not it's not as deconstructive as as I would do it maybe right, but you know it's also a thirty six minute video so he's not doing these seven hour deconstructions that I'm doing right, that's just my approach. I, I like to be I like to go to the you know directly to the actual argument right. Um, but with that said, I think there's a lot of good and valid criticism in his video here. And apparently, as he will say early on in the video, he has contacted Bernardo Castro in order to have a, 
uh, a you know video discussion with him about these particular problems as Bernardo, uh, and then Bernardo Castro has rejected that or said sort of no thank you, right? That is sort of you want to if you have the perfect metaphysics slash ontology for the whole world, as you apparently recently have said, hey, he's the only one for the next hundred years. I'm on this crusade of... And then if somebody asks nicely, well, would you come on my show and, and receive my criticism? And, and no, no, and no, I don't want to do that, right? It just goes to show that he, it's, it's bullshit, right? In the, in the sense that if, if you can't, you know, one of your academic in your academic club wants to have some constructive criticism that you could possibly say, oh, but the answer is this, the answer is that, and this is clarify this and clarify that. No, what he wants to do is go on the show where somebody is going to lick his ass, like the recent one on monistic idealism, where, they, oh, you're so, oh, Mr. 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 Bernardo, oh, I'm so sorry, oh, my, you're so great. Oh, 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 my, oh, oh, my God, right? Yeah, oh, my God, right? That's why he wants to go there. He can sit and just spout whatever he wants without any, you know, you know, uh, feedback, right? Or any pushback of any kind. So it, you would want to hone your skill against the hardest criticism, right? That's what you want to do if you think you have the greatest philosophy of all time, right? Yeah, okay. <clears throat> I have uh, recaptured, for, before I go into uh, the, the dealing with this video here, which I will sort of deconstruct or comment on, you know, within a, hopefully a short time frame, right? <laughs> Um, I have listed my problems with uh, my major criticisms. There are also some minor criticism here, here and there. Uh, let me take get those out of the way first, which is sort of equivocation of terms, using various terms without clarification, using the uh, mind and matter and and consciousness and uh, phenomena and 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 mind states and you know science, all sorts of shit that is sort of taken for granted as if there's already some ontology somewhere that is not disclosed, that he uses in order to describe this particular ontology, right? So there's a lot of use of terms that is not clarified in this, and, 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 and also bad argumentation structures and all sorts of things I have sort of pointed to various places in my deconstructions, right? But these are my major criticisms, right? Okay, and these are tough ones, right? that he needs to de deal with in order to convince me that he has done something actually constructive here. The first one is, there is no actual reduction presented to find a base, right? He doesn't present any reduction. He talks about a reduction base. He, ta he talks about doing reduction. Or a he has presented in his PhD thesis how physicalists do a reduction. And he says there's a problem with that reduction. Right? Or at least there are some you know, pitfalls in doing a reduction. And then he goes and says, well, uh, he says nothing about his own reduction. A, a, a reduction base is the sort of the foundational building blocks of your ontology, right? Your whole f philosophy for that matter, right? So if, you, if, you're, if you're appealing to a reduction base and a reduction, I would very much like to see that reduction and how you do it, right? Is that too much to ask? <laughs> there is no reduction anywhere, right? And as we will find out in the next one, which is also in his PhD defense, which I criticized recently, he appears to cherry picking a base, which he then chooses to be mind, right? Which is in itself an abstraction. You don't experience mind. So it can be a part of an ontology, right? So by picking an abstraction called mind, he will never get to any functional ontology because mind is an abstraction in the first place. And an abstraction cannot be the base of whatever ends up being that abstraction. But he appeals to cherry picking. He basically says, I have a principle. You just pick what you want. He says that in his defense. 
You just cherry pick, right? He is basically doing a fallacy of cherry picking, right? Which is, a cherry picking is a way of pointing to, if you can just pick and choose what you want, it's very likely, or pick and choose, it's very pick, <laughs> it's very likely that you're going to pick whatever you want to be because you already have in your in the back of your head, so to say, already have an idea of where this should lead. So by cherry picking, you're going to pick what you like. You're picking the cherries that has the perfect color, not those that are overripe or eaten by birds or those who are still green. You're not picking those, you're picking the perfect quality, right? And then you're cherry picking whatever you want to be the case. It is absolutely atrociously bad philosophy, man, right? I can't believe that it's a PhD thesis, man. It's the defense. The, the, these academics sitting there in their garment doesn't criticize this. I can't believe it, man, right? Oh, man. It gets my blood boiling, man. That these people, people are being forced to pay for these fucking idiots, right? Through their taxes or whatever. To pay for this charade called academia, man, right? Okay, with that out of the way. <laughs> okay, dashboard, as he keeps referring to, is a metaphor. It's not a base. He says, imagine you're sitting in a cockpit. Well, yeah, okay, I can imagine that. But then it's an imagination, an abstraction, some kind of idea. Then it cannot be a base. Because I need that base in order to imagine that dashboard, right? So a dashboard metaphor can never be a base, right? It can never be a starting point. It can never be a part of an ontology other than you can say a dashboard is a particular kind of category, which I would call an abstraction with reference to my recent uh, presentation of my ontology, right? The rule of ABC, right? So it keeps referring to this dashboard. Okay, fair enough. But would you mind telling me what you're actually experiencing that which you then call a dashboard, right? That doesn't work. As I say, the actual content of the dashboard is not described. He's just referring to this dashboard, the dials and, and, and you know, needles. But he's not experiencing needles and dials when he goes to the grocery store, right? Then he's sort of does colors and bananas and tomatoes, right? There are no dials anywhere. Okay, so the actual content of the dashboard is not an ontology. As I say, yes, it's not an ontology. It, or it's not in the ontology because he's not describing what the dashboard is made of. So the actual content of the dashboard is not in the ontology. Right? And that's what he's talking about all the time. Yeah, you have this dashboard, but I'm going to say there's something beyond that dashboard. Problems is that he is sort of, he's trying to avoid direct experience, it seems, right? And go into metaphors and, and abstractions and imaginations uh, uh, as soon as possible. Okay, next one, considers metaphysics and ontology. Now, this is a, maybe a point of semantics, right? In equivocation. I would like to keep these parts separated. Ontology and metaphysics, right? Metaphysics, these are, it's a dichotomy, you could say. Metaphysics is not ontology, and ontology is not metaphysics, unless you say that when I'm doing an ontology, I'm describing what there is, right? What there is, is what I can experience. It's a description of the phenomena, then. If I say there's something beyond my phenomena, an external world to my experience, then that cannot be an ontology then, because I'm trying, I would be trying to describe what is beyond what there is, then it can't be ontology, right? I would call that metaphysics, because it's beyond the physics, which is whatever goes on in the so-called dashboard, right? So metaphysics is an attempt of creating some kind of ontology of an external world beyond my ontology, right? That's why I like to call that metaphysics. And ontology is the description of what there is, what, what phenomena you have, right? And their, 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 their categories and their potential interdependencies, right? 
uh, it's an equivocation maybe, right? It's a, it's a mix of the terms. To, it, it's sort of a shell game thing where you, it moves the terms around. And you're not really sure what the hell is doing, right? Why are you using the same term for different things or different term for the same thing? Whatever, right? Okay. Uh, there's no argument for an external world. If you listen carefully, whenever he has presented something, there is actually no argument for that, that external world he keeps referring to, right? There's no argument. You can't just take it for granted. You cannot take anything for granted or given in your philosophy, right? Nothing is handed to you, right? You have to work. You have to philosophize about everything. You can't just say, ah, this is given and that is given, right? And in particular, an external world, which is something that is beyond your direct experience, right? Or beyond your phenomena. That cannot possibly just be given. If you need to ontologize your phenomena, but something beyond your phenomena is just given to you, that, that's, uh, that's crazy, right? So I would very much like somebody to tell me what the fuck is that argument for that external world I have never found any. I have never seen any. Please give it to me, right? And Bernardo Castor doesn't do that either. Basically, what I hear is it's just sort of given, right? Uh, there's no argument for why only mind, right? Why, why? If he says there's an external world, which is some kind of apparent imagination, that's what I'm going to take it as, right? Then... What makes him say? What, what makes him able to tell me what it's made of, and why would it be mind, right? What is it about it that makes it mind? There is no argument there either, right? The only argument or attempt at argument or an appeal to some kind of argument is, well, I, I, I avoid dualism by saying it's mind. So therefore, it's mind because then I'm avoiding dualism. It's a stupid fucking argument, right? Avoiding problems. It's not an argument for why you're right. Right? Then he keeps talking about parsimony. Well, parsimony is never an argument, right? If parsimony is, keep it simple, right? And if you have two competing uh, descriptions or theories or arguments for this, that, and the other, the simplest one is probably the one you should go with. But... These are not arguments. These are appeals to simplicity, right? These are appeals. These are not arguments. So I'm not buying this parsimony thing, right? Appeal to science and settling ontology. Yes. When you're doing ontology slash metaphysics, potentially, right? You are describing that which you are using to go and start doing epistemology, right? To get to an idea of knowledge, a definition of knowledge. And when you have knowledge, then you can go and do science. But that means you have to settle both ontology and epistemology and potentially uh, objectivity, I would say, right? Before you can even attempt at doing philosophy, uh, excuse me, doing science, right? And then he appeals to using science in order to settle his ontology. That is a fucking stupid circular argument, right? It's just encumbered by all his abstractions and all this vocabulary and this fluffy uh, lingo he's living in, the abstractions, right? And he's lost in all his cloud cars and abstractions. Then he can possibly do anything he apparently thinks, right? Apparently he thinks that science is given by the dashboard. Dashboard, you know, feeds him with science. No, science is how you approach your understanding of that so-called dashboard. And you need to understand what the hell is going on with the dashboard and classify the various styles and shit and, and, and point to what, which part of it do you classify as knowledge and which part of it could possibly be considered objective. Then you can go and do science. You can possibly do science without objectivity, but if you want to tell me about your science, I would like it to be objective, right? Or based on objectivity. And then the last one. 
why the fuck would I care about metaphysics, right? He does metaphysics because he says, I have some experience. I think there might be something beyond my experience. But if he didn't have that experience or, or phenomena, he wouldn't talk about something outside phenomena, right? So it's because of phenomena he's starting to think of something beyond phenomena, that external world. So it's because of phenomena he's talking about an external world. If he can classify that or describe that metaphysics of that external world in some fashion that changes his understanding of his phenomena, then he's violating the phenomena, which is the foundation for why he could do metaphysics in the first place. So any metaphysics cannot be allowed to change your understanding of that phenomena you used as the foundation or starting point for doing that metaphysics, right? Otherwise you would go into this circle of, well, then I, if I have a new idea, but then I change the foundation for starting my metaphysics. Now I have to do some new metaphysics that might change my idea and, and you go in this circle, right? So your metaphysics can never change your phenomena because that's the starting point. And if you can't change my phenomena, why the hell would I do it anyway, man, right? <laughs> it's useless, stupid mindfuckery, right? Okay, with that out of the way, let's try this video and see what he says. The philosopher Dr. Bernardo Castrup has grown an online following attacking the idea that reality consists of matter and replacing it with a brand of idealism that he calls analytic idealism. When viewers discover that I am an idealist, I regularly get asked to interview him on my channel. Well, I did invite him and he politely declined. So instead, I thought I'd research his views and discuss my thoughts. The result is this video critique, which focuses on my two main concerns and they are big ones. The first is his method of argument. The second is what he says about universal consciousness. But before I dive into those, a quick disclaimer. As a fellow idealist, I'm actually very grateful to Castrop for promoting idealism, and I find his views very interesting. And this has made me a little hesitant to make this video. But I trust Castrop to see these criticisms as the bruises. Okay, so... If you're in the club of academia, you have to be nice to the other academics. Fuck that shit, right? Either you're a philosopher or you're not a philosopher, right? You're not a part of a club where you have to be nice to this, that and the other. Oh, It's not necessary. If you have an argument, you have an argument. It doesn't matter if you are homeless sitting in, 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 in a pile of dog shit, right? Or you are in the fanciest ivory tower of academia somewhere with eight PhD and three professorships, right? The argument is still if the argument, no matter who presents it. So it's like all these niceties is, is sort of, uh, yes, the, I have to be nice to all the a a academia. Otherwise, they will think I'm just, you know, I'm toxic. Uh, right? It's a ah, get on with it, Ryan. This is of a friend and not the attacks of an enemy. And if he wants to discuss any of the issues I raise here, he is always welcome on my channel. So okay, so it there's uh, you know it's uh, it's an appeal to if you disagree, you're an enemy. Why? No, it's it, it's not. It, it's this the is this um thought of a, a trench warfare and if I'm if I'm against this I, I'm not a friend and you know no 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 it's about the arguments about the philosophy right it's not about being friends or enemies or anything like that right Be because you, you got it all wrong then it's about presenting your fucking arguments right so with the bromance done let's get down to business Castrop's way of arguing is to first undermine our intuitive belief that what we perceive is what there is. For example, when I look at this apple, I believe that it's a physical object in reality, and that it is... You're taking something for granted. A physical, physical object in reality, right? There's some underlying ontology there that you need to clarify. And it's, it's important that, I mean, Yes, 
you 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 have to start somewhere, I guess, right? You can't start at 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 ground zero every time you try to make an argument. On the other hand, I never see anybody start at ground zero, right? They always start somewhere in in the middle of taking all sorts of shit for granted before they start to argue, right? So, what it can merely allude to or aspire to is being about whether or not this particular structure of this argument is coherent or not. I say that's fine, but I would like at some point to have somebody say, okay, you need, before I start to argue this, you need to go and read my, at least appeal to it, right? My my ontology, my reduction base, uh, my reduction, my reduction base, uh, quite all the list of criticism of Bernardo Castro here, my reduction base, my understanding of uh, knowledge, Uh, what I mean by science, what I mean by uh, reality and, and objects, you know, right? Otherwise, we are still lost in a game of semantics, understandings, right? It has to be anchored somewhere before we start to criticize, right? Yes, you can find uh, absolute problems in, 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 in argumentative structure that, okay, there you said this, there you said the opposite, Which one is right, right? That's bad argumentation structure. Fine. But at the end of the day, what we really want is some some kind of coherent, complete structure of philosophy, right? And maybe I'm, uh, you know, shooting uh, birds with cannons here. I'm not sure. Maybe I'm just too engaged in these deeper ends here, right? But when we're dealing with Bernardo Castro, we are actually dealing with these topics here which I find to be of the utmost importance, right? So when you criticize, I would love to see if you have some uh, video where you're, you know, presenting your reduction base, where you're doing, you know, presenting what you mean by various terms and so on and so on and so on, right? Otherwise, it's still the same old game of semantics, right? Is as it seems to be, that it's in my hand, it's roughly spherical, and that it's red and green, and so forth. But Kastrup presents two arguments that are meant to show that this can't be how things are, that the world can't be as we perceive it to be. But What is the world? The world, the, it must be something that is given then, right? The world, what world? <laughs> what world? You're talking about an apple, you know, right? Uh, and uh, if you're listening to this, I'm just a sound on your so-called dashboard, right? In within your phenomena, I'm just a phenomena in your whatever, your your collection of phenomena. The world, what is that? You're taking shit for granted now, right? What world? What what are you talking about, right? But both of his arguments have problems that I think are connected to deeper issues with his method. To see that, let's take a look at his first argument. The first line of argument is based on the idea of entropy, the degree of disorder in the world, which we know from the second law of thermodynamics tends to increase. Now, our own bodies... I, I, I understand this uh, entropy thing, but... It's not a good argument, and I think he will deal with it later, right? That entropy is an interpretation of his dash dashboard. Then he, that, that interpretation cannot be an explanation of why there is a dashboard, right? Then it's circular. It's not a good argument. The argument you should go with is this. If you say that your experiences are in your mind and your mind is in your brain and your brain is in your skull and this hand is outside your skull, right? Then that hand cannot be an experience then because all, all your experiences are in there. But what if the hell is it? Because I'm experiencing that hand. How can I, it both be outside my experience and then be an experience? That doesn't work. There's a problem there, right? It cannot both be an experience in here and an experience out here, right? Because if it's out here, it's not an experience. And if it's an experience, it must be in there, right? It must be in there. But then it cannot be out here, right? What is going on? There's a paradox here, right? 
So you have to approach that. And the problem is actually that. It's the in there, out there problem. Right? As soon as you create that dichotomy, you run into this problem. This is what gives you. If you go with this idea that your inside experiences are actually also an outside experience, you run into the hard problem. Right? That's why there is a hard problem. Somebody's talking about the hard problem because they think their experiences are also outside or maybe only outside their own mind, right? If they're really crazy like illusionists. That's the fucking problem. That's the paradox you have to deal with, right? I mean, if you say, yeah, 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 all my experiences are in my mind, which is in my brain, which is in my skull, but I'm experiencing this hand outside my experiences. I'm saying, no, no, that doesn't work. There's a problem there. You're contradicting what you're saying, right? You have to go back to the drawing board and come up with a better explanation of what is going on there, right? That's the problem. That's the main problem. That's the actually the only problem there is. It is sort of taking for granted that there is this sort of world out there, right? How did you get to that? And why do you think that your experiences are also out there, right? That's the problem. Are a sort of a local effort to go against the second law of thermodynamics because our bodies need to preserve their structural and dynamical integrity. We don't want our liver and our but lung. What, what you don't want is has no influence on your philosophy. Your body wants this, your body... Uh, how the hell is that an argument, right? To mix with each other, like coffee and milk spontaneously mix. If our perception... And there's also a problem with this... Um, this entropy thing. First of all, he takes a, an external world for granted. Secondly, he takes for granted the, that world is somehow, for, for whatever reason that is not disclosed, very complex and complicated, right? And if it was mirrored inside, well, how would you possibly mirror something? How If it changes out there, then it immediately has to change inside. And what what would affect that change? And, you know, it, it's ridiculous. The, the, the thinking the thinking is the problem. The, the bad thinking is the, the paradox I just referred to. It is not these scientific things. These are just what problems that arise because you have this bad metaphysics in the first place, right? We're a transparent window into the world, then our internal representations, our internal perceptual states would mirror... Uh, yeah, I tried to say it before, maybe it wasn't too clear, but... This argument entails that you have an understanding of what is going on out there in order to compare it with some inside experience that you ha actually have, your phenomena. How would you be able to say anything about that external world? Right? It, it would be... It's like it's, it's chaos out there in its order in here. And if I had to ex uh, you know, ha have a direct experience of one-to-one -one experience of the external world, the, the internal world would also be chaotic, and therefore my, my liver and my stomach would melt together, right? It is unnecessarily convoluted, right? Just think of it this way, as I said. If you think that your experience is, is in your mind, and your mind is in your brain, and your brain is inside your skull, and you're saying my hand is outside my, my skull, how do you get to do that? Because if it's an experience, it needs to be in there, right? But why, what am I experiencing then, right? Because it's an experience in the best understanding I could say, right? But if it's in here, how can I say that that experience is out here, right? That's a problem I need to solve there. This is just a ridiculously convoluted way of pointing to this problem that is so obvious to me, right? states of the world out there 
the, the states of the world as it is in itself. But if that were true, uh, we would be uh, incapable of maintaining our structural integrity. Now, a way to visualize this is, uh, suppose this is the world outside, and it has a number of states which I'm representing here with uh, numbers. So state one, state two, state three, all the way to state six. The, the usual extreme abstraction, right? What is this, what is this, you know, cone structure that I'm looking at, but you're not looking at anything, right? It's the, he's still, he's still a materialist. He's still a physicalist about it, right? This is a physicalist paradoxical presentation of what you're doing, right? If we were to mirror the states inside our brains, as you see here on the left-hand side, um, the entire dispersion of the states of the outside world would be mirrored in the dispersion of our brain states. And if that were true, we wouldn't be able to maintain it. But there wouldn't be any brain states, right? It would, one to one, there wouldn't be a brain. There would just be these ma imagined states. Because what would the brain then be, right? Some which is beyond that one to one. There's a there's one to one inside something else. That's another category called brain. So when you get into these abstractions, right? Be fucking careful with these people because they are fucking crazy, right? They he doesn't understand what he's doing. He doesn't understand his own philosophy. Our structural integrity again. We would dissolve into an entropic soup. In a nutshell. Kastrup says that we intuitively think that our perceptions mirror the world, but the world is entropic, which means it's tending to a state of chaos. So if our brain states mirrored the way the world is, then they would be entropic too, and we would dissolve into what he colourfully describes as an entropic soup. Okay, so there are some pretty basic errors with this argument. First, we don't intuitively think that our perceptions perfectly mirror the world. We think we perceive things well. in the world... What do you mean, we? Why don't you speak for yourself, right? How do you know what we think? Who are those we? Am I included in that we? Or is it just a select group that you have pointed out? Or, you know, who are they? Are they only academics with a PhD or what? What is it sort of a... The elite? Uh, I mean, what, who are those we? Speak for yourself. This is your philosophy. It's not our philosophy, it is your philosophy, right? Uh, directly, without anything getting in the way. When I look at this apple, I don't think I'm looking at some mirror image of the apple on a screen of perception. I think I'm perceiving the apple itself, as it is, out there. The view of perception I've just described is... No, but then you misunderstand what he means by... That's why it's the problem to use... As I pointed out in my criticism, use this dashboard metaphor because it alludes to that there's something extra he adds. No, all of this colors, sounds, elephants, tomatoes, you know, abstractions like science and philosophy and ethics and, and feelings, emotions and desires. All of that is what he calls a dashboard, right? That's why it's a problematic approach to philosophy to start out with a metaphor because people are going to misunderstand it anyway right i mean you could say that's not the fault of the one presenting the metaphor that people are misunderstanding it but it is a bad way of doing just point to your fucking ontology describe one to one there are colors there are sounds there are tastes there are elephants which is a concept you know think just fucking describe your ontology right start with the basics Typically huh? called naive realism or direct realism. It's called naive realism because most philosophers agree that it's the naive view of perception. Most philosophers agree? That's not a fucking argument, mate. It doesn't matter how many agree or disagree, right? But then Copernicus was an idiot, right? Because he was the only one who, uh, and a few Greeks or whatever, right, who believed the sun was the center of the solar system. He was an idiot. He was the only one. There was thousands or, you know, whatever, right? Uh, people tend to agree. That's not an argument. That is sort of an, 
you know, an inverted bandwagon or, you know, an appeal to authority or something like that. It doesn't matter how many agree or disagree, right? It's about how the good argument. Is it a good argument or not? In other words, it's the view of perception we have before we stop and start to really think about it. But the uh, the view of perception, I'm not so sure about that. Naive realism is that there is a world outside me. And that experience I'm having is that actual outside. I'm experiencing that apple while at the same time I'm saying that apple is outside me. Right? That is the thing. What I'm experiencing is that thing. There is no, it's, there's no thing beyond... It, the apple is not a representation. The apple is the apple. That's it in naive realism, right? There is no perception as such. There is no... If there's... If there's a, if the, and, and that's sort of a problem because then you can... But, but don't you experience the apple then, right? Okay, yeah, I'm experiencing it, but I'm... It, I'm experiencing, if you start to scrutinize a naive realist, you will very quickly run into problems because they cannot get around that. You have to experience it somehow, right? Because why are your eyes open and your ears, uh, you know, whatever, right? So if you argue that way, then you have to ask the naive realist, well, how does that apple arrive to you, right? Because if it arrives to you, then it cannot be that apple out there. Because now it's arrived inside you, right? So if it's inside, it's no longer outside. So if, it's, if it has to be an inside, well, at the, at the beginning of things, you had to have that experience inside to have anything at all. So you never had an access to an outside. And if you're saying there is an outside, what you're referring to can merely be a representation of whatever is out there, right? Naive realism is saying, no, 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 no. That experience I have is the actual outside. That's a problem because that is that fallacy of that inside-outside dichotomy I discussed before with the hand outside the, the skull, right? That's why it doesn't work. And believing that you are actually having a direct, you couldn't even call it an experience, you actually have that direct external world access that is naive right the other label for this view direct realism is actually more descriptive and so more helpful for understanding the view it's called direct because we believe we perceive objects directly without anything like a screen of perception getting in the way yeah but but you per perceive it directly but that that is an isn't that called an oxymoron right if, if it directly, it's not perceived, right? That it is that, and then you would have to be you. You would have to be the whole universe. You will actually be a solipsist. In the the end, in the end conclusion of naive realism is actually solipsism, right? Because you are the whole universe. You must be. If you experience everything. If if you have direct realism, as he calls it here then all you have is all that is real. There's nothing beyond it or, or before it, right? Then you are the whole universe, but then you're basically a solipsist then, right? There's nothing else but that. And if you start to say, well, that person is out there, well, then you're saying, well, out, 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 out where? Beyond your experience. It can't be because there's direct realism, right? And this is the problem of these physicalist materialists. They cannot square this circle and that's why some of them them end up with illusionism right that you are basically a fucking illusion and there's an external world out there that is not you but apparently you have access to it anyway right and that's why i think there's a lot of traction towards idealism because people identify there is a fucking problem here somewhere right they might not be actually able to pinpoint where the actual problem is and how to you know solve it correctly because when they see the problem, they don't reject all that the problem is based on. And one of those things you have to reject, at least in the first place, is 
that access to an external world as if that external world is given to you somehow, right? That was just habitual thinking when you were a materialist, physicalist. If you reject and see the paradox, you have to reject the external world. That was why you the, that that was which created the problem in the first place, right? And it's called realism because we think we perceive objects that are real and independent of our mind. If I'm right, about well, how can it be independent if you perceive it? So, you, if you need perception, which is a part of your your phenomena, then you can't be independent, right? I'm not saying that he's just, you know, f framing the, the understanding. That it's not necessarily his thinking. But I'm, you know, reflecting on that kind of thinking. You can have it both ways. You cannot perceive the real thing. That is an oxymoron. You cannot both per perceive it and then it be real. If you perceive it, it's not real. In the sense that it's not the thing you're... If you're perceiving it, it's like saying that the photograph of the moon is the moon. No, it's a photograph of the moon, right? It's not the moon if it's a photograph. I'm photographing the real moon. Yeah, but the photograph is not the real moon then, right? And if, if all you have are photographs, you don't have the real moon then, right? So it's, it's, it, <laughs> it's incredible how convoluted this can end up being, right? About what the intuitive view is, then the argument that Kastrup needs to undermine is not the view he attacks. And the arguments he raises simply wouldn't work against direct realism. Now, as it happens, direct realism is generally considered wrong anyway, but not generally for the considered Kastrup is not an argument, mate. Generally considered, but have you called all the twenty-five thousand taxpayer-funded uh, philosophers all over academia and asked them? Well, yes, we are above the ninety-nine percent level of. People agree on this, and therefore, argument doesn't work, right? Sense. Among other things, it's rejected because if we perceive the world directly as it is... What world? What world? <laughs> You're appealing to some world that you haven't clarified what the hell is and how you got to it. Please, mate, you have to clarify how you get to that world. How... Where did, where, where does it come from? You can't just appeal to a, a world without clarifying how the hell you got to it, right? You might as well be a hobbit in Middle Earth then, right? And it doesn't seem possible to perceive it incorrectly. For example, if it's the real apple that I'm perceiving directly as it is, then it must be exactly as I perceive it to be. No, 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 then... no, 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 no. Then it's not naive realism. Okay, if direct realism, okay. It's like... It's the, there's an apple, how the, and there's a perfect apple inside me. But if you, if you already know what this apple is, and you have a perfect copy, why do you need the perfect copy if you already know what that apple out there is? Why would you encumber yourself with a, a representation that is one-to-one -one if you already know what it is? Or no, I don't mean in an epistemological manner of knowing. But if you already have access to the perfect apple out there, why would you need a representation in there, right? And if you have that perfect representation of all that is out there, you are a solipsist then, right? And if you don't want to be a solipsist, you have to establish an external world. And how do you go about doing that? How do you get to that idea of an external world? You can't just say, I, I, I don't want to be a solipsist. So therefore, there must be uh, an external world. That doesn't work. It's not a good argument. Give it to me. What is it about your experience, your phenomena, that enables you to say, aha, and therefore, it must be that there is an external world. Give me the argument. Please, somebody out there. There must be somebody who can give me that fucking argument, right? And that makes it very hard to explain things like illusions or hallucinations or why some people see things differently to others. So okay, but then you have to define what you mean by illusions and... and uh, what, was the, <laughs> what was the other term, right? You, you, you can't explain this then. But, but what is this that you're talking about? How do you define that, right? So you can't bring in some, all of a sudden bring something else in and say, well, then you can't explain this then. But, but what, what is this, this then, right? 
Right? It, it's this midstream kind of philosophy and argumentation, right? So as direct realism probably isn't a good option anyway, maybe it doesn't matter so much that Castrop doesn't argue against it. So let's say we move on from direct realism and adopt the position that Castrop actually attacks. That when we perceive the world, we perceive but, but, but a mirror... But a second, when we perceive the world, what world? What world? What is perception? What part of your phenomena is that perception? Is all of it uh, some perception of an, ex an external world? Why do you think there is an external world? I'm not saying there isn't. But what is your fucking argument? Is it an axiom you're working from? Then please say you're working from that axiom. Because you're talking of it as if it's sort of given to you there must be an external world. Right? That's what you have to start with. That's if you're, if you're taken for granted there is an external world. You run into that paradox. Right? You have to deal with the par you're very likely you're running into that paradox, right? Because if you know there's an external world, why do you need a perception of it? Right? And if you have something, then why are you calling it a perception? Because you just have some colors and sounds and taste and so on. That doesn't necessarily mean there is something external to it, right? Then clarify how you get to that external world. Start with that, mate, right? If you don't want to do basics like reduction and, you know, ontology, then tell me how you get to an external world. Give me the fucking argument, right? Image of that world on our screen of perception. And this is a view that I would call perfect indirect realism. It's perfect because the image that we see is meant to be a perfect match for the thing it represents. It's indirect because we don't perceive the world directly, we only perceive it indirectly via the image on the screen. And it's called real. Oh, so that's Kantian. That's, yeah, never mind. It doesn't really matter if it's Kant. But that is what we are, we are experiencing something that is a representation of an external world we do not have access to. We can, we can, Say we have experiences we are classifying as representation of an external world, but making it perfect indirect is whenever I experience an elephant, there is an object out there that I don't have access to, but it's the same whatever, let's call it object, that is behind the elephant. When I experience elephant, there's always the same thing beyond which I don't have access to, right? That's also a claim you can't substantiate because of these illusions and uh, whatever mirages. Uh, it's like, I experienced elephant. Oh no, that was not an elephant, that was a rhinoceros. But is that because that outside world changed just now in, in a few seconds, it changed from an elephant to a rhinoceros? How would you know? It's about that establishment of that external world. <laughs> Give me the argument for that external world, please, right? Somebody out there. All you fucking academic, you millionaire philosophers out there, give me the argument for that external world. And if you don't have the argument, say so. And if you're arguing or using the idea of an external world anyway, please state it as an axiom, not as something that is somehow derived or arrived at or, you know, given to you or argue or anything like that, just say you're working from the idea because you cannot argue for it. And if you think you can argue for it, give me some fucking, you know, surefire, bulletproof, you know, once in a lifetime, you know, perfect argument for that external world. Otherwise, I'm going to have to reject your philosophy, right? Realism, because we still believe that the things that are appearing on the image are also real objects out there. So let's go with that and say that Castro presents perfect indirect realism as the intuitive view and the one he wants to undermine to convince us of something different. Now I don't... Okay, so at 6 minutes and 27 seconds, that's where we will take off in part two of this, right? So stay tuned, have a nice day, see you there.